Woodbridge, New Jersey, the kind of town where not much really happens while holding tons of history behind it, such as being the oldest original township in New Jersey, being granted a royal charter on June 1, 1669 by King Charles II of England. But one evening, the town's name would be etched into history forever, having the deadliest train wreck in the history of New Jersey occur here. This would be known as the Wreck of the Broker. Around 5 p.m. on Tuesday, February 6, 1951, Pennsylvania Railroad Express train number 733, the Broker Special, left the exchange place in Jersey City to Bayhead Junction via the New York and Long Branch line. It carried over a thousand people in 11 Pennsylvania Railroad class P70 heavyweight Pullman coaches, led by Pennsylvania Railroad K4 steam locomotive number 2445, a 462 Pacific that was an extremely famous class of engines on the Penzi, not to mention there were over 425 of them built by the Pennsylvania Railroad's own Juniata shops in Altoona and the Baldwin Locomotive Works. The engineer that day was 52-year-old Joseph Fitzsimmons, an old hand with 33 years experience who hasn't had an accident in his career so far. The reason for the large number of passengers was because of a worker strike occurring on the Jersey Central Railroad causing commuter operations to grind to a halt. 26 miles away was a temporary trestle that diverted from the original route parallel to Fulton Street due to construction workers working on the New Jersey Turnpike being built below so workers could supervise on the original tracks. The Pennsylvania Railroad issued a speed restriction in the area reducing speeds from 60 miles an hour to 25 miles an hour. Six trains had passed over the brand new trestle previously without incident so far. Engineer Fitzsimmons began to slow his train as he got near the trestle as he had already known about the speed restriction. However, the rails were still wet and slick due to a previous rain and the train's weight from being overloaded meant it was approaching the trestle at over 50 miles an hour, twice as fast than it should have been. Fitzsimmons slammed the brakes into an emergency stop, but it was already too late to prevent a catastrophe. Seven cars of the Pennsylvania train, a commuter train headed for Bayhead Junction in the Asbury Park area, have been derailed. Six of them are lying on their sides on this uh, embankment just off Fulton Street here in Woodbridge. Personal observation was that the uh, trestle erected just today and used for the first time today on the Fulton Avenue side of the regular Pennsylvania line had collapsed and splinter, sending the cars of this train down into the embankment and some into the street. The cars themselves were buckled and twisted about as though they were bits of wood and not made of heavy steel as they are. The weight of the train and excessive speed split the rails on the temporary curve, causing the K-4 and eight cars to derail and crash down the embankment. The K-4 skidded onto its side 20 feet from the remains of the bridge followed by the first two coaches tumbling behind. The third and fourth telescoped into one another, and the fifth and sixth dangled from the remains of the bridge. One coach bent into a U-shape from the collision, and another was crushed on its side. The wreck occurred in a heavily populated area, so help was very quick to arrive. The Woodbridge Fire and Police Departments were the first official rescue agencies to arrive at the scene. They found it extremely difficult to climb up the slick, muddy embankment to get to the coaches, and next to impossible to pull the injured from the train and back down through the mud without slipping. Ladders were laid down on the embankment, and rescuers used the rungs like stairs. The Woodbridge Fire Department used their ladder truck for nearly the same purpose, except they were able to extend the ladder over the embankment and directly onto the coaches. 
ambulances, first aid squads, and medical personnel came from at least 20 neighboring communities and cities. The Perth Amboy General Hospital, the nearest urban hospital, was alerted that there would be a large influx of passengers. Perth Amboy went to full disaster mode and received nearly all the people whose injuries were serious enough for an immediate and intensive medical care. First aid squads assisted those injured who were able to walk with treatment at the site. The number of injured and dead passengers was so great that a local grocery supplier had its trucks pressed into service as not only additional ambulances, but also as hearses to carry the bodies later on. Within 30 minutes, an enormous crowd had arrived and surrounded the crash site. Some volunteered to help, but the majority had come out of morbid curiosity to watch the bloody drama unfold as victims in the coaches pled for their lives. The vast number of onlookers pushing in on each other rapidly became a nightmare within itself. Ambulances experienced great difficulty getting in or out of the site, rescue workers had to struggle to get through the crowds, and vital rescue equipment was being smashed under the massive feet of curious bystanders. Seeing how the behavior of the crowd was delaying the rescue operation, and possibly costing the lives of victims in dire need of help, Governor Alfred Dreskall called in the New Jersey National Guard for crowd control purposes. The guardsmen stood side by side, arms linked, forming a human chain, after which the rescue and recovery efforts could continue as normal. The whole area was lit with acetylene torches and countless flashlights could be seen bouncing around as rescuers searched for anyone still clinging on to life. When a survivor was found, a call went out for assistance and the rescuers would work in a group to chop, cut, or pry away any obstructions that might be pinning the victim. Then they would be loaded onto a stretcher and carried down the ladders toward the street. Some victims were able to walk away from the incident, whether they received medical treatment or not, and have been released, or had been uninjured. Many people living near the crash site opened their homes up to the stunned and shocked individuals to aid them. They were offered food, warm blankets, and most importantly for some, the use of telephones to phone families telling them what had happened. A total of 85 people were killed, including the fireman of 2445, who was crushed when the K-4 slammed onto its side from the impact, and around 500 were injured. Most of the deaths occurred in the telescoping 3rd and 4th coaches. Because of the large death toll, a place had to be found to store the bodies until identifications could be made. There was no place large enough that could accommodate the huge number of bodies being pulled from the wreckage, so it was decided that the garage of the Woodbridge Fire Department would serve as a temporary morgue. But the idea of laying bodies on the dirty floor of a garage was not welcome. The problem was solved when a local butcher donated large rolls of waxed brown paper. Each body would be brought into the garage with a sheet of the brown paper unrolled, and the blood spattered workers gently placed the body onto the paper. Then another sheet of paper was cut and laid over the body. Witnesses described how the feet of the dead were sprawled limp, uncovered, by the paper shrouds. Some of the bodies were so badly mutilated that it took hours to identify them, and then only by an, an article of clothing or personal belongings. As word of the morgue's location spread, terrified family and friends of anyone who was supposed to be on the train that evening lined up outside, praying that their loved ones would not be lying on the floor, many of them realizing the grim reality if this was the case. One of the last victims to be freed was a man that had his body partially crushed and trapped under one of the coach's wheels. The rescue and recovery effort continued non-stop until the last body had been removed from the wreckage that night. The National Guardsmen also stayed to keep looters and souvenir hunters from climbing onto the wreck and either getting themselves hurt or stealing valuable clues for investigators. Investigators quickly arrived at the scene from the FBI, Interstate Commerce Commission, and even the Pennsylvania Railroad themselves opened their own investigation. The FBI led the investigation to a possible sabotage, but found this was not another city of San Francisco wreck, 
finding no evidence of sabotage. The Penzi pinned the blame on the engineer who survived the wreck, since the train was traveling at around 50 miles an hour when approaching the trestle, which was way beyond the restriction of 25 miles an hour. After all, the conductor did remind him of the restricted speed, but as the train got closer, it was not slowing down for the bridge. Alarmed, the conductor tried to reach the emergency brake cord, but due to the overcrowded coaches, he couldn't get to it in time. Even more baffling, reports suggest that K42445 didn't even have a speedometer in the cab at the time. The engineer stated that he was indeed traveling at 25 miles an hour, however if that was the case, he wouldn't have been flying off the curve and tumbling down the embankment. Who was correct? Well, as it would turn out, the Pennsylvania Railroad came under heavy fire. According to Interstate Commerce Commission reports, the Penzi failed to install proper warning devices, such as flashing lights and signs, to warn of the speed restrictions. Middlesex County Court then went to accuse the railroad of using the engineer as a scapegoat for their negligence and filed charges for 85 counts of manslaughter, but they were later dropped since the trial would have bankrupted the county. In the end, the ICC labeled the probable cause as excessive speed on a curve of a temporary track. They recommended that the Pennsylvania Railroad install an automatic train control system and that it first install such a system on the New York Division, where it would automatically enforce a speed restriction of not exceeding 20 miles per hour while proceeding through a block occupied by a proceeding or occupying train, and that it will enforce a safe speed under temporary conditions similar to those that existed at Woodbridge when the accident occurred. Furthermore, they recommended that the Pennsylvania Railroad provide adequate warning signs to indicate speed restrictions in such areas unless they are protected by automatic train control. Fitzsimmons continued to work with the Penzi for two more years, but never ran a train again. K42445 was amazingly repaired and returned to service, but unfortunately was retired in 1953 and scrapped not long after, like many of her siblings. However, the K4 class is still well represented by two survivors, 3750, who's currently on display at the Rare Museum of Pennsylvania in Strasburg, PA, and 1361, who is still undergoing restoration to operational condition in Altoona's Memorial Museum. One year after the accident, passengers went to the rear of a train, dropping 85 flowers at the crash site, one for each death. 70 years have gone by since the incident, but numerous incidents of overspeed on a curve would still occur later, such as the 2015 Amtrak 188 incident in Philadelphia, Cascades derailment in Washington in 2017, and so on. Thankfully, correct procedures have been taken ever since, so disasters like this hopefully never occur again.